to give us the particulars of the uh, process that uh, needs to be adopted by the board in order for this meeting to occur. Uh, commissioners, what you have before you for action today are two new rules to the uh, Union County, North Carolina Board of Commissioners rules that both pertain to electronic meetings. In other words, enabling us to do what we need to do to cope not only with the advent of the coronavirus or other pandemics, but frankly just as a, a form of modernization that some other counties around the state and both localities have already done. But uh, ours are in the form of two rules. Uh, the first you'll see is Rule 34 that allows for the electronic meeting itself. And the second is Rule 35 that deals with public participation during an electronic meeting. Public participation might come in the form of a public hearing, such as we have today, or it might be an uh, informal comment, public comment time, either one of those. Uh, you'll see the way those rules are laid out uh, before you. Uh, because of that, you will hear some, uh, probably some, special comments today uh, from the chair in the, in the way that he conducts the meeting, but some of them will be simply uh, to point out and be specific who is making what motion, who's voting on what, and in the event that we have a lost connection, how we deal with quorum issues. But I won't go into the details of the rules, except in as much as you have questions about them, I'd be delighted to talk about that, but uh, if, the, if there are none, I'll retired to the back. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. These are temporary rules that only last for a certain period of time per meeting, or how, how does it? These are rules that, that will continue on past this, that will allow electronic participation or telephonic participation by a commissioner moving into the future, independent of whether there's a state of emergency or a pandemic at that time. These are changes now because of the pandemic, but they will continue on the way they're currently How can they? How can we meet? So we could call in and meet on the, with the telephone. Or? That's correct. So from this point uh, forward, from this point forward, uh, should the chair so elect, or a majority of the commissioners so designate the writing, you can designate that meeting an electronic meeting and allow for remote participation. Should you choose to do that in the future, due to a weather event or a travel emergency or something uh, like what we're experiencing now, on into the future, or, or for any. Or for any reason at all. It doesn't have to be a stated reason. It's simply the call of the chair or a majority of the board. To, to designate it as an electronic As meeting. an electronic meeting, that's correct. Commissioner Wright has a, a question. You're, mu you're muted, Dennis. Dennis, you're muted. Okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. When we had the agenda meeting, we talked about leaving it in play. I remember last year you had to come back from a vacation for an important vote, and we talked about that. So we're going to keep it in our tool chest for future trips where you're with the family out of any of us. So that's all. Other questions for Jason? Commissioner Helms has a question. Commissioner Helms has a question. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, my question is, is this, uh, is there a requirement that it be a video conference? Uh, Mr. Helms, I believe your question was, correct me if, I, if I didn't hear it right, uh, I believe you asked if this could be a video conference. I think he's asking, can it just be a phone call versus a video? Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Helms, we're having a little bit of difficulty hearing the feed, but if your question is, uh, can this be a video conference or a phone call, yes, either one of those two methods are permissible ways to participate in the meeting as uh, a commissioner or if it's during a comment period from the public, uh, some of those ways can pertain uh, to their participation as well. 
I'm, I can't understand the tavern. Give it to us, sir. I'm sorry you broke up again. I couldn't, I couldn't make out what you were saying. I heard video conference. That's it. You may participate by video or telephone. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Just, just some concerns, and, and I think I'm I just with this going on. Um, I think I'm going to vote against it. I don't mind voting for it today because of unusual circumstances, but I can see in a situation where someone like myself on the eastern side of the county with very uh, unreliable internet access would have trouble attending the meeting, even though I plan to attend the meeting. So. I, I think I don't think that this should be a policy going forward. I mean, this is a very unusual circumstance, very unusual case. But this is if, if just like the trouble he's having hearing us, we're having hearing him. The freezing up of the internet concerns me, and and there's no telling who's in the room with me, telling me what to say or do if I'm on the telephone. So I'm I'm not going to support anything past today. Uh, understood it's in the discretion of the board as to how long the rules last as drafted right now they continue on if, if there's a desire to uh, amend those drafts or adopt them for a different time period that's fully within y'all's discretion to do that all right in an effort to move forward um, one of the first things we need to do is establish a quorum so uh, uh, for the purpose of establishing a quorum commissioner Ray. Commissioner Helms, I need to, for you to identify yourself and indicate that uh, you're a part of the meeting for the record. Commissioner Ray. This is Dennis Ray, Vice Chairman, and I am listening and viewing the meeting from April the 20th. Thank you. Commissioner Helms. Yes, I can hear you and participate on the uh, August 20th meeting via video conference. Okay. So that means April. Thank you. All right. Uh, Commissioner Rushing, uh, with your uh, concerns, would you like to make a motion yes. with regard to this uh, process? I make the motion that we continue with today's meeting um, as we're doing and then maybe look at this at further date for other meetings but just for this meeting on this any discussion hearing none all in favor of Commissioner Rushing's motion say aye aye, aye. opposed aye. Mr. Ray you want to tell us how you voted affirmative Commissioner Helms affirmative, affirmative. okay affirmative thank you very much all right, uh, based on the uh, technical difficulties that we seem to be having, uh, I was uh, shared the information that we do have uh, the ability to recess the meeting in the case of uh, a lost connection. Uh, and if we cannot establish that within a reasonable time, we can carry on without that commissioner's participation as long as we have that quorum. So, uh, I want to uh, share, uh, make sure you're aware of that, understand it, and Commissioner Rushing, you have a question. I need to make a clarification with the attorney. If something happens and either gentlemen have dropped from the conversation, their vote will not count as an affirmative vote. If they are dropped and then, and then there's an attempt to reestablish a connection, a connection cannot be reestablished, at that point they would no longer be included in the meeting for purposes of voting. Right. Uh, if there were a situation where they in effect, just don't vote electronically of their own will. It would be just as though someone didn't vote here, and that vote would be counted in the affirmative. But if it's due to a lost connection, the quorum shrinks to four, and the voting pool is full. Okay. okay. I want to make that clear. All right. At this point, we will move on with the opening of our meeting and our invocation by Commissioner Agnes. That's right. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come together and do the work of the people of Union County. Lord, we pray a healing on our land, 
our citizens of, of Union County in the state of North Carolina. Lord, we pray that you'll lead, guide, and direct our actions, that they may be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. take this opportunity uh, each uh, meeting to uh, recognize our employees who have uh, some tenure with the organization and we will begin uh, this uh, meeting with recognition of Michelle Lancaster Sandlin in the county manager's office five years so congratulations Michelle Thank you. Uh, we have Ethan Hickey with the library five years Deborah Colston with the sheriff's office five years Cheryl Bowers with Human Services Business Ops, five years. And then with 10 years, we have Jonathan Davis in the Sheriff's Office. With 15 years, both in Social Services, we have Karen Crowder and Peggy Redford. And then with 20 years service uh, in Public Works, Laura McManus. And then the Tax Administration, we have two employees, Philip Avery with the Tax Administration, 20 years and Jody Fowler-Lemon with the Tax Administration for 20 years. So congratulations to those employees for their uh, service to the county. We have uh, also uh, two items of recognition this week. Uh, we have National Public Health Workers Week. And uh, Mr. Manager, would you like to uh, come on, come in on that, or do you have someone on staff to defer to uh, Miss Lancaster on that, since that's her area of responsibility? Okay, good. Absolutely, thank you. Um, as this item denotes, April 6th through the 12th is National Public Health Workers Week, and we felt like, particularly given the the current situation and the work that public health is doing, that bringing this before the board even past the week that was nationally recognized was important. And as you can read in the, the background, public health professionals help communities prevent, prepare for, withstand, and recover from the impact of a full range of health threats, including disease outbreaks, natural disasters, and disasters caused by human activity. The group of employees that we have in our organization are important not only to our organization, but to our community. And we wanted to take this opportunity to allow the board to thank them for their work and continued efforts in making us a healthier place to live and work. Thank you very much. And our next item is a Proclamation for National Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Month. I'll take this one as well. This is the Division of Social Services. And again, as you can see in the background, in 2019, the Division of Social Services received 2,184 reports of child abuse and or neglect. And of those, 1,616 were accepted for investigation in Union County. In 2008, Prevent Child Abuse America introduced the pinwheel as a national symbol for child abuse prevention through pinwheels for prevention. And if you ride by our Human Services Building, you'll see our blue pinwheels out on the street denoting this important uh, time for the community. So what we're asking the board to do today is to adopt a proclamation designating the month of April 2020 as Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Month in Union County and urging all citizens to recognize this month by dedicating ourselves to the task of improving the quality of life for all children and families. Thank you. Uh, motion to adopt the proclamation. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, two uh, recognitions that are very timely considering the circumstances and to we appreciate you bringing that to, to the board. Our next item is uh, public hearing Stafford Corrugated Products. I believe we have Mr. Ron Mayo. Ron with us today. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. The Chairman Simpson, Commissioners, Manager Watson, it's my pleasure to bring before you this afternoon an economic development and Senate grant request by Stafford Corrugated Products, otherwise referred to as Project Emerald. Stafford Corrugated Products is a manufacturer and distributor of a wide variety of goods for the corrugated box industry, and they supply box manufacturers across the United States. The company has been located in Indian Trail since 1994, and they currently employ 25 people. 
The firm started conversations with our office in 2016 about a potential expansion. Discussions began again in earnest in late 2019 for an investment of $5 million to construct a new 50,000 square foot building in the Old Hickory Industrial Park. That structure will serve as its headquarters for all sales, marketing, production, and distribution needs. The project is anticipated to create three to four new jobs. Again, the company is considering a $5 million investment, and they have indicated that incentives are a very important factor for the project. Therefore, today, we are requesting your consideration of a step two economic development incentive grant in an amount not to exceed $115,000 to be paid over five years beginning in fiscal year 2022 based upon the Union County Tax Office's appraised value each year on the company's anticipated investment of $5 million. Based on this investment, holding all other factors constant, including depreciation, the company would pay estimated ad valorem taxes of $182,725 on that new taxable investment over the grant period. Of course, actual tax revenue to the county will be based on the current tax rate applied to the assessed value of the investment each year after depreciation. As we do with all of our projects, we perform a cost-benefit analysis uh, on this particular uh, investment. And this project shows a 1.7 to 1 return over the first five years of the project or the grant period. And that ratio in, uh, increases to 5.36 to 1 over the life of the project. Therefore, the Monroe Union County Economic Development Board and uh, Board of Advisors and staff recommend the award of this step two performance-based incentive grant to Stafford Corrugated Products in an amount not to exceed $115,000 in order to help secure this $5 million investment. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Next on the agenda is our informal comments. Thank you very much. We have no one signed up for informal comments, so we will move to additions, deletions, and or adoption of the agenda. Commissioner Rush, uh, can we take item number nine from the consent to put on the regular agenda? We have a request from Commissioner Rushing to remove item nine from the agenda, consent agenda, place it on the regular agenda. Um, as I have been instructed, uh, we will do that via roll call vote. So Commissioner Ray, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Helms, how do you vote? Nay. Right. Commissioner Aikmas? Nay. My vote is a nay. Commissioner Rushing? Motion fails. Further additions, deletions, or adoption? I'd like to add an item on here to discuss reopening Union County. We have a request to add an item to um, discuss reopening. Commissioner Rape, how do you vote? Hey, would you repeat uh, the what you're The adding? request is to add an item to the agenda to discuss reopening of Union County. Jerry, I'm having trouble hearing. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll repeat it one more time. We have a request by Commissioner Aikmas to add an item to the agenda to discuss reopening of Union County. How do you vote? Yes. Mr. Helms, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Rush, yes. Mr. Simpson, yes. All right, and we will make that um, Item, I'll put under old business. Uh, 
Okay, item, uh, we'll make that 36A, how's that? Okay. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. We have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Commissioner Rake? Yes. Mr. Helms? Mr. Rushing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Unanimous. All righty. That takes us to consent. Motion to approve consent. Commissioner Rake, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Helms? Commissioner Rushing? Aye. Yes. Commissioner yes. Aye. That takes us to old business. We have no old business. Takes us to new business item 36. Consider award of a step two economic development incentive grant to Stafford Corrugated Project Products Project Emerald, an amount not to exceed 115,000 over a five year period beginning fiscal year 2022. Motion to approve. Motion to approve as presented. Okay. I'm going to award it to Commissioner Aikens. It looked like a tie, but we'll give it to Commissioner Aikens. Commissioner Rape, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Helms? Yes. Commissioner Rushing? Yes. Commissioner, yes. Commissioner Simpson, aye. Thank you. That takes us to 36A, Commissioner Aikens. Yes, I would just ask that uh, the board consider sending a letter to Governor Cooper. Um, you know, I think right now we're, we're conducting surgery with a machete versus a scalpel. And uh, my concern is, is uh, Union County as a whole is suffering. Our businesses, our community members here are uh, at great risk. And I, I fear that this has become more of a political issue. I would uh, suggest that we know our constituency better than, than anybody in Raleigh. And I would ask that the, we send a letter requesting that the governor uh, allocate the authority to the counties individually. Uh, there's 100 counties in this state, and I think uh, the individual counties know their folks better than, than, like I said, the folks in Raleigh. So I would just ask that we uh, send that letter requesting uh, that we are allowed to, to make that decision for our people. Okay. Uh, just a procedural question. Uh, who would draft the letter and I would suggest it comes from the board as a whole. Okay. Can, uh, uh, may I suggest that perhaps we had uh, General Counsel Jason K. draft uh, a letter and we'll pass it amongst the individual board members and take edits and suggestions uh, and then provide you with a final copy. Refine. And are you going to authorize the chair to sign that? Okay. Mr. Rape, are you clear with the motion and the action to be taken? Yes. And how do you vote? Right. Can we have some discussion? Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Discussion here. Thank you, Mr. Rape. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I also agree. As a person that's involved in a business that's essential, um, what damage this is doing to the economy and, the, and to the people in the county is very subjective. Uh, even the stimulus checks that came in. Uh, those folks who have businesses that have been most impacted are not able to, you know, to be open to collect any of that money that people may want to spend with them. So this is absolutely the right way to go, and, and uh, I'd like to thank this board for not closing the county down in the first place. Uh, I think that was uh, a wise decision, and I think, like Commissioner Aikman said, uh, this is a machete, not a scalpel. And uh, you know, when you look at the threat of uh, people being fined for attending church services in their vehicles and, and uh, just completely subjective and silly uh, enforcement of this uh, throughout the country. Uh, I think it is time that we uh, make it as a local decision what, what we think is important in Union County. So thank you, Mr. Agnes, for making the motion. Further discussion? 
Hearing none, Commissioner Rape, how do you vote? I vote in favor of it. Commissioner Helms? I vote in favor. Commissioner Simpson, aye. Commissioner uh, Michigan Aye. Takes us to um, item 37. Amendment board rule. We've taken care of that, have we? So, yes. Uh, Jason tells us we've taken care of that. Okay, 38 is Union and Lancaster County Stormwater Grant application. How about, how about standing right oh, here, here so they catch you on the screen? There you go. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Manager Watson, I'm here to present a agenda item regarding a potential grant application to the U.S. Department of Transportation for their build solicitation. Next slide. Okay. So the build program was previously called the TIGER program. It was created in the previous recession in 2009. It's for innovative transportation projects. Some years planning grants were available, some years it was 100% for capital projects. For this solicitation, which was announced earlier this year, there's $1 billion available nationwide. This cycle, planning grants are an eligible activity with $15 million available nationwide. Uh, with these grant applications, 20% local match will be required. Application deadline is one month from now, May 18th. And the award announcements will be made later in the fall. This is a highly competitive process. Even good projects may not get funded. Typically, you have 10 times as many dollars requesting uh, as available funds. And so this is the program that we would be applying to. Next slide. And what we are applying for is a stormwater planning grant in cooperation with municipalities as well as Lancaster County to look at the interface of our storm drainage systems in the county as well as the transportation system. Commissioner Helms, could you mute your uh, mic? Commissioner Helms? Thank you. Now try. Right. So this is a study that was actually brought to us by the Town of Indian Trails, a potential study for the county regarding our stormwater system. We've had some pretty big events in the last few years that have flooded and damaged a lot of roads and bridges, culverts and pipes. And between the municipalities and the NCDOT and the county, to recognize there's an issue. We're continuing to grow. These issues will in all likelihood get worse. And so Indian Trail brought this as a potential study that is obviously larger than just the town of Indian Trail to look at what is the system, how does the water flow, where are the choke points, are there bridges that need to be made bigger, are there culverts that need to be turned into bridges, are there potentially roads that are acting as dams and should be raised and turned into bridges that could uh, reduce the frequency and the severity and duration of flooding events in the county. And when you look at the county, especially to the west, you're going to the Catawba River. So we asked Lancaster County about their feedback about such a study. And they said they would like to participate in it as well. And so we have um, done some preliminary work in order to bring it to you for feedback. But the application timeline, again, we would submit it in May. We would like to work with the consultant to develop the application because a lot of this is technical work. What would be the process? What's the cost? What's the timeline? What are the expected deliverables? And we estimate that the budget is three quarters of a million dollars for this overall application. But we would come back to you with your uh, direction to move forward with refining an application at, on your May 4th meeting to actually get a resolution for the application with a much harder number in terms of the total budget and the match for the county as well as the municipalities and Lancaster <coughs> County. The map on the right is from Hurricane Florence. It shows all the roads that were closed at any one time during that event. Obviously, that was a, uh, a historic rain event, but we had a similar number of roads closed last year from, uh, from just a winter storm. So it, it just shows the, the breadth of the, the impact throughout the county. Next slide. So in terms of coordination, this started from Indian Trail a couple months ago. We 
looked internally, spoke with emergency management, stormwater and county management, to see whether this study made sense. All agreed that it would be valuable. We then consulted the NCDOT. For the most part, this is their road network. They said, yeah, we haven't had the ability to do studies like this. And looking at what the impact of different severity of storms would be on our system and how we could target our bridge replacement program and other maintenance activities to improve the flow of water through the county would be beneficial. We also reached out to municipalities because we don't want to do studies in their jurisdictions without their consent or uh, participation. 10 of the 14 municipalities have, have responded back saying they would like to participate, they would be willing to uh, contribute match. We also reached out to Lancaster County. They have this on their agenda for next week with a resolution of support. They would be participating and providing match as well. If we look at a 20% budget of match out of three and quarters of a million, that's $150,000. Doing some calculations based on square miles of the municipalities, their population, as well as their density, we estimate that Union County would be responsible for a little less than half of the overall match, so on the order of $65,000. That's assuming a three quarters of a million dollar budget. That would be uh, refined over the next couple weeks as we work with the consultant. And we bring that to you on May 4th for a not to exceed number for the final application. Next slide. And so the deliverables from this is one, in terms of looking at the specific choke points in the network, to say these bridges should be replaced and expanded first, these culverts should be expanded and replaced, these roads potentially should have culverts or bridges installed. Secondly, you're talking about uh, regulations. We're talking about a county that is growing by tens of thousands of people per decade. These bridges have lives of 50 to 75 years, so we want to make sure that we are taking care of the demand side of the water. And so this study would also come up with recommendations that the municipalities and the counties could incorporate into their uh, development standards to reduce the severity of stormwater runoff as these storms happen. And obviously that is up to each individual municipality or county to uh, implement. But in terms of the, the DOTs on both sides, this would be a direct input into their decisions on where to replace bridges and what kind of designs to use when they have to um, upgrade them or replace them. So next slide. So the request from the board today is to request us to spend up to $10,000 in consulting expenses to actually develop the application. The uh, Follow-on actions would be to coordinate with the municipalities in Lancaster County on local match and resolutions of support. Bring that to you on your May 4th agenda for, um, for approval. The application would be submitted no later than May 18th. In terms of the local match, we do not expect the local match implication to hit uh, the budget until FY22 to, or 23. This would be a 18 to 24 month process that we're talking about for the overall plan and work wouldn't begin until mid-2021 at the earliest. And so I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. When I saw this uh, item on the agenda during a gender review, it brought back to recall several situations where we've had uh, some rezoning requests or uh, uh, developments, uh, and oftentimes uh, community spoke or individuals spoke uh, about uh, the impacts of the stormwater and what they experienced and showed pictures of their property and how it had been a impacted by uh, stormwater uh, so so I believe it uh, it could certainly prove beneficial as we move forward as Bjorn said continue to grow so I will make that motion that we authorize staff to spend that 10,000 on consultant expenses uh, for the uh, build program grant Mr. Rushing Aye. Mr. Ray Aye. Mr. Ray how do you vote Mr. Ray? Aye. Mr. Hick? Mr. Helms? Aye. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, North Carolina 75 and Old Providence intersection, local match assistance. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman Simpson. This application, I don't have any presentation for this. This is the intersection of NC-75 and Old Providence, uh, just east of downtown Waxhaw. This is an intersection that Union County uh, contributed a thousand or a hundred thousand dollars to the application in coordination with the town of Waxhaw last year. Uh, this was one of our top intersections from our critical intersection program. It was funded for a little more than $2 million for a roundabout as a part of a recent Parkville project solicitation. Unfortunately, as part of the design process that we're actually doing through our critical intersection design program to come up with alternatives and to choose a preferred alternative, the design process came up with some additional improvements immediately adjacent to this roundabout, uh, particularly at the intersection of McCain and Old Providence, which is across from the uh, recently rehabilitated mill site in downtown Waxhaw. That's a high crash location. And also Waxhaw, in order to improve the walkability of their town, wants to have additional uh, sidewalk accommodations for that uh, area of NC-75. Also, there's some access points that they've uh, determined need to be made um, more uh, accommodating to adjacent businesses, particularly a church and a, a gas station on the north side of that intersection. And so the cost estimate for all those improvements has gone up by uh, a little more than a million dollars. That is something that, that was a design consideration that the town of Waxhaw has decided they think is acceptable. They want to apply for additional funds from CARPO to fund those additional improvements, and they've asked Union County to participate in that uh, grant application, which is going to be due in the, in the coming weeks to CARPO. So the request to the board is for $75,000 in additional funds. This is within the $500,000 pilot program that was approved by the board several years ago for intersection programs. This would be matched by $300,000 from the town of Waxhaw, so it's definitely leveraging state, uh, or not, sorry, not state, but municipal and federal funds to deliver a better project that is critical to downtown Waxhaw. And so the request is to uh, commit uh, $75,000 out of the program. The money would not come due until later in that project, probably FY23. Um, but that is the, the request. It's highly supported by the town of Waxhaw, and they're taking it to their town board for approval as well. Questions? Well, having traveled that uh, that road from my house to Waxhaw on numerous occasions, with the opening of the uh, gas station across the street as you come into that intersection, uh, I, I see it as well needed. Um, so I'll make that motion that we uh, approve the uh, additional 75000 for local match. Any discussion? Commissioner Rushing? Commissioner Ray? How you vote? Commissioner Ray? All right. Commissioner Helms? Uh -huh. okay. Thank you. That takes us to item number 40, appointments to boards and committees. First being Board of Adjustment. We have uh, terms of following members expire in April, and the 19th to be exact. Darren Green, regular member, Bill Work, regular member, and Christopher Edwards, alternate member. And all members have uh, applied for reappointment. Motion to approve all members. Okay. We have a motion. Commissioner Rushing. Aye. Uh, Mr. Simpson. Aye. Commissioner Ray. Aye. Commissioner Helms. Aye. Okay. Thank you. And next is our planning board. The terms of the following members of the planning board expire April 19th. Don Fisher, regular member, Russell Wing, regular member, Robert McNally, alternate member, and Christopher Patrick, alternate member. 
They have all applied for reappointment, and in addition, we have received a application for uh, the planning board from Chris Bova. Motion to reappoint the members as they serve. The four members: Don K. Fisher, Russell Lane, Robert McNally, and Christopher Fisher. Okay, we have a motion to reappoint Don Fisher, Russell Wing, Robert McNally, and Christopher Patrick. Mr. Agnes? Aye. Mr. Ray? Aye. Mr. Helms? Aye. Mr. Simpson? Aye. And that takes us to the COVID-19 update. I'm going to kick this one off, and Dennis is here to, to contribute as well. Um, this is to provide the board an update on the county's response to COVID-19, and I'll, I'll just give some context. So today is day 37 of an active EOC, Emergency Operations Center, for the, for the county. We opened on March the 15th and had our first positive COVID-19 case on March the 18th. Um, on behalf of the management team, I don't think I can say enough about the staff and the dedication and professionalism that they've shown over the past month. Emergency management staff with the leadership of Don Moyer, our public health staff with Dennis's leadership, communications staff, fire, law enforcement, EMS, the public schools, nurse staff, our atrium staff. There are so many people who have played a part in keeping things moving smoothly as we go through this unprecedented time. Additionally, I'd like to recognize the provision of food for students who might not otherwise have it from Union County Public Schools, assisted by the Monroe Police Department and our Sheriff's Office. As of today, they have delivered or provided 94,284 meals to folks in this community. We also have a COVID-19 hotline that is operational Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And on average, it's taken a couple of dozen calls per day that has been as high as in the over 100 calls at certain times. This hotline is being staffed by our UCPS school nursing staff, and they've really been outstanding in coming to our aid and, and not only providing that staffing, but literally standing that up and managing how that process has worked for us on a daily basis. Our positive case number at this time is 162 positive COVID-19 cases in Union County with six deaths. Dennis will provide a further breakdown for you of the cases and context regarding our trend in Union County. I want to cover three categories of things that Dennis is going to speak in more detail about. Um, particularly, I want to talk about congregate sites, long-term care facilities, and assisted living centers fall in that category data and as well as our testing and personnel protective equipment and questions that you may have heard and others have provided for us in the community. I'm going to provide an overview of each of these categories and then Dennis is going to provide more specific detail. Congregate sites are assisted living centers and long-term care facilities in the community have been an area where we've got lots of questions about how public health is interacting with those sites and in, in, in terms of COVID-19. So I want to provide just a little context regarding communicable disease control in North Carolina and the role that local public health departments play in managing a response to a communicable disease, which is what COVID-19 is. Preventing and controlling the spread of a communicable disease is one of the core activities of public health systems throughout the world, not just in North Carolina. And the law in North Carolina provides a legal framework for com communicable disease control that, that really out outlies most of those things under the purview of the state. Responsibility for communicable disease in North Carolina is shared by state and local health officials. However, most of anything regarding an outbreak, the state officials take the lead for developing and coordinating a response. In this instance, is no different. I want to cover this for a couple of reasons. One is so that the board and the public have a more complete understanding of the role of local public health in communicable disease. And additionally, we've received multiple questions about our handling of congregate um, living sites, and again, Dennis will provide much more specific detail about those specific questions if you have any questions there yourselves. The other um, area that I wanted to cover is around data and this question of recovery and how many people have recovered. That is something that we've received several questions about. And um, I want to first say there really isn't a definition of recovered. There are different people who are providing different answers to that question. And so what we have done is try to prepare our data in a way that we believe has been fairly consistent from day one 
as you will remember, we initially provided data on the number of positives per zip code. We just did a total number. You can see that on a daily basis. A couple of weeks ago, we moved to a dashboard format for providing our data, and this dashboard includes total of cases and number, a historical chart that can be selected to see how that number has changed over time. It's presented by zip code, gender, race, age, number of deaths, and also provides the cases and deaths for the entire state of North Carolina. This dashboard is updated daily on our website, as it's provided once per day on our social media channels. And, and I would have to add that our communication really has seen a lot of engagement. Um, when you look at our dashboard, the, um, the cumulative views for both versions, our desktop and mobile, are at almost 169,000 views that we've had of that. So people are using that to collect data. Um, that, and I want to give some thanks to folks, actually that was created with some staff in Public Works who use GIS on a daily basis. Ariana Mercer and Luke Fawcett, along with Brooks Versace in communications. Um, we've also done a community newsletter that we're doing weekly. Our website has seen tremendous traffic around the COVID-19 outbreak. It's about 15% of our total traffic has been at the COVID site. And the average view time of those pages is a little over four minutes, which is double the average time that we ever see on our website currently. <clears throat> The term recovered, again, is one that we, we don't currently have a standard definition for. We are working, and Dennis will talk a little more about this, to provide a number weekly of individuals that are no longer being monitored by our staff, so that that gives folks an idea of how many people have moved through the system in terms of monitoring. And we think that will be an important uh, data point to share. The last thing before Dennis comes up is to talk about personal protective equipment and testing, again, an area where we've received quite a few questions. We feel pretty good actually about our ability to obtain and deliver PPE to first responders and others that are requiring or asking for it in the community. These would be our long-term care facilities, the hospital, child care facilities. We have a process for taking those requests in and are filling those. And we're continuing to work on providing um, PPE for our staff as we bring them on board. And I think Mark might talk a little more about that later. Um, in terms of testing, Dennis is going to talk about our role and how we think we can play a role in that. And at this point, I will turn it over to Dennis and give him the, the floor. Thank you, Michelle. And I want to first start by thanking the county administration for the support that has been given to uh, us in addressing COVID-19. Uh, clearly, this is something beyond what we traditionally deal with in public health, as, as you all know. And it takes uh, a lot of folks to respond to something as massive as this. Uh, and I couldn't be prouder of the folks that we've been working with, emergency management. I couldn't be prouder than my team, uh, the public health staff, and particularly the municipal disease nurses who are doing working long hours uh, through the weekends, uh, and they don't let up. They keep going. So uh, there's been a lot of folks to come in and thank, and it starts a lot with the administration. So I want to certainly share that. As Michelle shared with you, in terms of looking at our data, uh, clearly our, our data has continued to trend up. We uh, uh, are at, she said, 162, and we have had six deaths, uh, unfortunately. And I want to point out that. The reason we do this is clearly for that reason. We want to reduce the number of deaths. Any deaths uh, are, are, uh, are, are too many. And so we're trying to, to, uh, to prevent as many of those as we can. And when you look at our um, total numbers and the breakdown based on um, different classifications, you can see that on our dashboard, which actually shows a breakdown by zip code, and I'm not going to go into all of those particular ones, but I did want to uh, share with you a couple categories that uh, uh, are important. One is, uh, in terms of age category, we have 38% um, of our, uh, the folks that have been positive are in the 40 to 59 age group, which is roughly sort of in the same category. That's the larger group. That's typically the one that the state is seeing as well. Uh, we also have a, a little bit higher percentage, 36% who are above 60 in uh, the positive age group, which is a little bit higher than the state average. 
in that regard. Uh, in terms of gender, it's roughly 50-50, uh, and in, in terms of the uh, race and ethnicity classifications, 62% uh, or right at 63% of the folks who are testing positive have been white, uh, with 22.8% uh, African American. And there's been some discussion around that nationally as well as statewide uh, about the impact of the social determinants of health that can be uh, sort of realized in some ways when uh, we see uh, 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 communicable disease like this. Uh, that hits certain groups sometimes a little bit harder than others. So that certainly is an area of, uh, of concern. In terms of ethnicity, uh, we are at 14%, uh, which is roughly what our, the population uh, breakdown is. Looking statewide, we are, uh, North Carolina has 6,842 deaths uh, as of uh, around midday today and they have 202 deaths in North Carolina. Mecklenburg, to our, our west, obviously has a big impact on our region. They are uh, a leader in terms of North Carolina's overall uh, cases at uh, 1,210 cases and 29 deaths. And I point that out only because uh, the virus doesn't know geographic boundaries. It's out there. And so a lot of what happens with a large population like Mecklenburg County is going to have an impact for us. We saw the increasing uh, first cases that we saw were really on the western side of the county, which is not unusual. We would expect to see that. It's a larger population. It tends to reflect much of how Mecklenburg kind of uh, functions and operates. It tends to uh, travel in those circles. So we, we expected that to happen. And just like it, uh, it sort of drove us into where the, the spread was starting, uh, we also need to be looking at that from a regional standpoint in terms of how the spread starts slowing. Uh, there was, a, I wanted to comment a little bit on the, uh, uh, one of the challenges that we're dealing with right now is related to uh, some of the long-term care facilities. We have two outbreaks in the community that uh, overall has increased our numbers. Obviously, it's a vulnerable population when you start getting into long-term care facilities. It's extremely challenging to manage those uh, in those facilities, and uh, it certainly gets our heightened attention. We've had regular communication with all of the facilities in our county. Uh, basically, one of the key roles that we play is education and guidance on CDC and state recommendations for communicable disease control to make sure they're aware of what they need to be doing to, uh, uh, to deal with positive <coughs> cases that may occur in that facility. And also we're gathering information on those cases just like in the community. We're doing contact tracing and we're recommending control measures and, and serving there as uh, providing guidance. Uh, I want to share though that we're not an oversight or regulatory body for long-term care facilities. We uh, accept from the standpoint of environmental health, which does uh, deal with uh, the sanitation aspects of those facilities. Uh, we don't regulate their overall operation. That's regulated by the Division of Health Services Regulation at the uh, DHHS in, in Raleigh. So much of what our role is, is communicating, keeping a, a, a regular communication with them and educating them issues that they're dealing with. Uh, as it relates to the, uh, the data and uh, the, the information that, was, that we're sharing, one of the things that we are, I realize that people want to, I mean, the question of recovery is one that seems obvious to some. Uh, we collect data and we, it's, it's funneled through a system, uh, our uh, North Carolina Electronic Disease Surveillance System to it as NC heads. It captures information from labs, the positives and negatives, and we get those positives to us and they're assigned. And we, at that point, our communicable disease nurses start working to do contact tracing. We're calling the individuals and uh, talking about their families, where they're working, and that kind of thing, and giving them guidance as to the, uh, the, what the, uh, the 
isolation period may be and others that may need to be quarantined. So it's a fairly labor intensive process. And uh, in terms of looking at data, um, you know, the counts are, I mean, everybody likes numbers. I mean, my big thing is I want to make sure the data that we're presenting has meaning. And the, one of the things that the data uh, that we have from that NCS is essentially uh, once we uh, work a case, we set an isolation period, uh, we then after seven days from the symptoms onset for that individual, and if they've been three consecutive days also symptom free, we can release that case in the system. And in essence, it goes back to the state and we're not following or monitoring that. That's as close as we can get to what I call recovery. The actual terms in the system is, is died or survived uh, in terms of the, the, the two fields. So one of the things that we're going to uh, start sharing, as Michelle mentioned on a weekly basis, is the, uh, that number of uh, survived or the ones that have been released in that system. And right now, as of today, it's 110 that are in that category. So clearly that is uh, 110 in what category? 110 who are in that survive or what you could uh, loosely define as recover mode. Uh, we're no longer then monitoring them. Uh, just because we set an isolation time frame, when we follow back up with them, they may still be symptomatic, and so we have to continue to keep them in the system longer. Uh, so that's a number that we're going to start uh, uh, sharing as well. Personal protective equipment and testing, uh, the, as, as was mentioned earlier, we have uh, a very good job, and I want to commend the folks at the EOC and the folks at our uh, local receiving site, which is actually over at the health department for our human services building, um, where we're actually housing all of the PPE that's coming in and we're giving that out. We have, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of what we've uh, uh, what we've taken in uh, in terms of surgical masks, uh, and this is actually distribution, uh, 6,235 uh, gowns, 1,687 uh, gloves, 3,500 3, face shields, over 1,000 respirators, N95s, which are commonly uh, uh, in short su uh, supply, 1,500 and hand sanitizer over 3,000. In most of those categories, there's what we consider medium availability or good availability. Gowns are in a low availability category and we're trying to source uh, opportunities to get that. Um, and uh, for the most part, we have been able to meet some of the demands that, that uh, local first responders have had. And maybe not getting all of what they want, but we've been able to keep them going and uh, we feel pretty good about the status of, uh, of our PPE at the current time. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. How many of our frontline employees, firefighters, sheriff's department uh, people have contracted to COVID-19? Uh, right now, right now. And, and of our employees? Of our employees. Of our employees, how many? Zero. N nobody on the front line has contracted to? Our he asked about firefighters. So. Firefighters. Yeah. For firefighters, we have had, uh, yeah, there have been, I can't quantify the total number, uh, so I'm not going to hazard a guess, but when we've had uh, a handful of firefighters that we have had positive and we have worked with them, we one of the things that we do in the EOC is once we get that information, we're talking with the chiefs. We're also talking with that individual. We're identifying who they've been around, who needs to come off the shift, who else needs to be tested. Uh, we facilitate that with our medical director and the hospital in getting them in because we realize they need to get tested right. appropriately sooner because the sooner you don't want to lose fire coverage for a right. unit uh, or for a part of the community. So When, when you have uh, a family, let's say, uh, the, the dad comes in and has it. How many members of the family are also testing positive? Well, the recommendations has been uh, if it's a family member who has, uh, if you got someone who's positive in the household 
everyone in that household is going to, we're going to treat that as it's going to be a positive. So, but are they tested? Uh, not necessarily with the recommendations and the guidance from the state in terms of... Uh, are those included in the numbers? Yeah, well, uh, no, they're not only, no, they're not included in the numbers. So like if there was a family of five, one tested positive, right. it, you just show one positive right. test. And right. All right, well, we're which, reporting our positive tests only. Correct. And which points to the issue of, uh, you know, early on, the causal limitation in testing availability and uh, uh, the kits, a lot of the guidance and recommendations sort of changed and really focused on just testing symptomatics, just testing certain categories of, of uh, for example, uh, hospital or healthcare workers who are working in it. They had these stage priority areas. And so those are the ones that got really the, the, a lot of the tests. Or obviously if you were a, uh, you know, a contact with a first responder or something of that nature. Uh, some, of that has, some of that has changed over time. They started then recommending that if, even if you did not have, uh, if you just had mild symptoms, uh, to basically stay home and ride it out because they were not recommending uh, going home and testing unless you actually started getting more um, difficult symptoms and then you needed to follow up with your physician. I find it remarkable that none of our health department employees or people that were on the front line of this have gotten sick at all. Yeah, I won't talk about that. We're very fortunate. We're very fortunate. Uh, the last piece I wanted to mention uh, is Yeah, one of the things is uh, we're hearing a lot about where things are moving and sort of this new transition. And you've heard of the two, the three T's: testing, tracking, and trending for following trends. And you're hearing that from the state on down. Uh, we are, as Michelle had mentioned, you know, one of our primary functions has not been a big testing site. We have done some testing, but it's been limited because Atrium and Novant have both established some testing capabilities and have done a very good job of availing themselves with the, with the uh, supplies that they have. Um, our role has really been in the contact tracing arena. And so as we move forward, you know, it's possible that we may get more involved in some aspects of testing. And, tra and tra we're going to always be doing the tracking, and we're going to be doing this for a while. This is not going to go away even when things start to open back up. Uh, we're going to need to do that judiciously and we're going to continue to have to be focusing on social distancing and looking at uh, those things that we've been doing to kind of flatten the curve. And the question becomes, well, okay, Dennis, have, have we flattened? Do you think you've flattened? Well, I think we certainly have slowed down things. We're still seeing numbers climb and a lot of that is driven by some of the long-term care facilities that we have. Uh, but keep in mind, too, that these long-term care facilities, the numbers that we see, also include staff. that just include the residents there. So those residents, I mean, those staff members are also back out in the community, too. So we know this is not going to be a quick flip the light switch and it's going to go away. Uh, as we build, and, and the state is working to build on additional testing and tracking capability, we certainly are going to be there uh, working here locally to build that capacity and, and do all that we can uh, to, uh, to move us to where we need to be. But uh, with that, I'll close. And if you have questions, feel free. Yeah. You said you were going to mention something about the employees? Yeah. yeah. Now or during the I, comments? I've got some comments. And Thank, Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Good job. Real quickly before, before we move on, the parks. Um, did the state government close the county parks? We did. Who did? We did. We, the board did. The, you you I did. did. Can, can you reopen those yeah, just to see? You're going to address that in right a yeah. yeah. Okay, Mark? Yep, sure. Okay, um, our, our next. Uh, we have a closed session plan, I'm assuming, procedurally, we want to go ahead with comments. Mr. Manager here, the and then we'll uh, have that motion for closed session. Okay. That's
That works. That works. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Could you please repeat what you said? <laughs> <laughs> Don't take that serious. It's going to be long. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what I, because it's been a while since we've uh, met together and there's been so much that has, has happened, I wanted to provide uh, the management staff with uh, a, a few minutes each um, to uh, update the board from their perspective and make any comments that uh, they would like to. So, uh, Patrick, would you like to? come and, and uh, address the board. Thank you. Uh, I would say two of the departments that have probably been impacted the most by this are Parks and Rec and the library. They have been shut down entirely. There you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, they've been shut down entirely for about two or three weeks now. And um, since they've been shut down, um, there's, a, there's a number of jobs they've been helping out with around the county, but they haven't been able to do their primary jobs. So the library staff and Parks and Rec have been running a lot of the senior nutrition routes because with the congregate sites down, there's, a, there's still a demand for those meals, but they're, um, we can't have them in person. So there's been a, a lot of routes created in this effort, and they've been picking up the slack there. There's also a group of six librarians that are sewing masks for staff, too. So they're, uh, we appreciate the work they've done in this trying atmosphere. Um, most of my other departments are uh, emergency related. The uh, 911 folks, they've been working out at Concord. We're, we're, Fortunate to be getting them back this week. They will be in the new renovated space starting uh, Thursday. Um, the EOC has been open for just about 40 days there. And I'd like to say thanks to Don and Andrew for running the EOC. There's been a number of groups and organizations that have helped. Um, Monroe Fire, Monroe PD, they have had someone there almost every day. The Sheriff's Department has had someone there almost every day. The school nurses that have been running the call center have done a fantastic job. Um, all the VFDs who have been uh, required to do things differently than they have in the past, and they've, they've answered that challenge uh, very, very well. Um, EMS, who has been helping us get, get uh, supplies from the state and being that conduit between the hospital and our emergency responders. Um, uh, the Ag Center, uh, Andrew has helped out with various departments. Obviously, we're not having events there right now, so it's been a, tr a trying time for him and his staff because they are not, not currently working. Um, but again, all the all the first responders, we just want to say thank you for for doing what they are. They've they've handled this situ situation with the utmost grace, and they've adapted uh, considerably in the last three weeks. Uh, do you have them on the farmers market? Yes, sir. So originally, we had not planned on opening the farmers market until May. Uh, we are going to open that uh, market starting next Saturday. And the plan is to have two markets a week. We normally do one in Monroe and one at the Health and Human Services building. Uh, since that facility is indoors and that market is a pretty tight space, we're going to move that to the, the Monroe market too. So we will have a uh, Thursday market and a Saturday market starting next Saturday. Observing all the social distancing yes. and there will be special things that uh, apply to all that just like there are in retail stores. Yes, and we're going to provide PPEs and hand sanitizer to all the vendors. We're going to make sure that uh, patrons can distance themselves from one another and just put all the uh, security measures in place that we can to make sure they're safe while we're there. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, do you have some yeah, things to share with us? I do, yes, sir. <clears throat> so like with Patrick, I, I want to reiterate, um, you know, our staff around county have been working. I don't think the public is aware of how much work is actually going on with our county staff. And, and I want to first thank all our staff for everything that they do and just sort of recognize my group and some of the things that they've been doing. Um, I hate that I can't go through everybody, but I can tell you something about what my group is doing. Environmental health, um, they've been able to actually whittle down the backlog with septic systems and wells. Um, actually, in, this week they should be ready to actually open it back up and start taking some new permits for that. Uh, they're also helping to making sure that um, our businesses are are you know, following the proper procedures for public health and public safety. Uh, public Works is uh, steady keeping our water system and our, our sewer system running, providing safe drinking water for our, our customers. Uh, they're also um, doing the development review and keeping up with development review. And, and I think if you were to ask them, they have not seen a slowdown when it comes to development permits. They're still seeing a lot of permits to review. Um, building code. 
They've not slowed them down. They are doing inspections. They're uh, processing billing permit applications. Uh, they, they are uh, out there in the field getting the work done so that our builders and our homeowners can do these projects, these repairs. Uh, planning, they're still doing uh, major subdivisions and minor subdivisions. Rezonings were put on hold for just a little while. Uh, but they are having plenty of business with uh, rezoning, I'm sorry, with uh, subdivisions, minor and major, as well as development permits. Our fleet office, keeping the sheriff's office uh, vehicles going, keeping the uh, county vehicles safe, so they're, they're operating. Um, solid waste, uh, people will think about it, but we don't want garbage piling up on the side of the road. Our convenience sites are still operating, landfills operating, and we opened a brand new um, convenience site, our residential waste and recycling center at Gold Mine. That opened April 16th. Uh, so that, and actually we've had a number of customers out there. That's good. So work is still going there. Um, last but not least in my group is uh, facilities because people you know, think even though the public is not really accessing this building or any of our buildings for the most part, they're keeping these buildings going, operating, they're helping with making sure they're sanitized and clean. Also, they're responsible for the projects that we have going on, major build projects with the uh, Jesse Helms um, facility as well as the library and then the other uh, property development that we have going on, so they have been keeping that on task. So I hate that I can't talk about all the departments, but I would like to recognize the work that they do and that we're very proud of, of making sure that we've uh, reduced the impact of this pandemic on the public as much as we can. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Michelle? So I'll round out the, the group. Um, and I, like Brian, I, I can't talk about everybody that is in, or in the areas that I've worked with. And I've mentioned a couple of them already today in some of the presentations, the work communications has done. Uh, public health, they're obviously you know, heavily involved in the work that's ongoing every day. But additionally, public health is still seeing regular clients on a, as appointment based, as needed appointment basis, um, 8 to 12, Monday through Friday, and staying busy with that. Our human services area continues to be very busy um, while we're using staggered work schedules and teleworking. We probably have about 75 to 80 percent of our staff are working from home. Um, and have been able to do that very well. Just to give you a snapshot of our last week's numbers for human services, telephone calls received at human services, 621 calls. Our staff there scanned almost 2,000 documents and we received 665 documents in our Dropbox at human services. So they are continuing to, to turn the work through um, just as if they were there. Our transportation staff is continuing to, to make medical, medically necessary trips. Our veteran service is doing things by you know, online and, and telephone to keep that, that work moving. Um, Stephanie Starr and Community Support and Outreach has been doing her regular work with WIC and the groups that she supports, but she's also stepped up and taken a, a role as food coordinator with our EOC in terms of the pandemic and what the state expects us to do in terms of being prepared and allowing people to have access to food and resources. Stephanie uh, Gloria Haney, who manages our volunteer services, and Janet Payne have worked with communications to put together a new website called UC Cares that will be utilized to identify community needs and resources during this emergency situation, but they can also be stood up in future emergency situations when there's a need in the community and folks are ready to rally and, and bring together uh, the resources that they have to bear. Our tax office continues to work either teleworking or staggered work schedules, um, and we are continuing to waive online payment fees dur during this pandemic, and I think that is working well for our customers. And finance, Debbie Cox was named as our interim finance director and is doing a great job working with those staff that are teleworking and doing work, uh, staggered work schedules as well. Procurement is very busy. Um, I think we have 10 active projects that are in some form of, of the procurement process currently. And that's those staff are teleworking or working staggered schedules as well. The big area that several have asked questions about is budget. This pandemic had a, an impeccable timing um, to hit us right at the time of building the manager's recommended budget. So um, the staff in budget are actually working staggered work schedules or are teleworking and staying um, on top of their work. 
We're also working to adjust all of our revenue numbers for FY21 and particularly our sales tax numbers because we know that is where we're going to have some impact. So we plan for you to receive financial and, a financial and budget update at the next board meeting, May 4th. This will include year-end estimates and refined projections for FY21. Our goal is to provide the board with a budget by May 30th that lays out current service levels at our FY20 budget amount. Additionally, we are working to articulate our priorities so that if we do see revenues increase going into FY21, the board will understand the investments that we would be looking to make with those increased sales tax dollars. It is our hope and expectation that the budget that we present, the manager's recommended budget, would be easily understood, not require a great deal of debate and, and meetings of the board and staff, just given where we are currently. And of course, while we're working to finalize this, we're also faced with the realization that our current sales tax numbers are, are going to be off. Um, so we are looking uh, to adjust those numbers, and I'll give you some context for that, and then I think Mark is going to give you some additional detail on how we plan to bridge that gap. Prior to COVID-19, we were on pace to collect about 102% of our sales tax number. So a little, about $49 million, I think is the number. We're now looking at a 20% decrease in our last quarter's sales tax. And as you all know, we don't see sales tax until three months after it's realized. So this is all an estimate that we're making along with guidance from the state. And so at this time, we believe that we are looking at losing about $3 million in this last quarter. And so this presents some challenges for us, but I think we've come up with a good plan. And, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Mark. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. So offsetting the sales tax revenue, uh, you heard Michelle say it was about $3 million. Um, and that, that hits a number of our different lines um, to offset that. Uh, in this last quarter, we are looking, uh, we, we have frozen all uh, staff travel and training, uh, and we've frozen all open vacancies. Um, we're reviewing any high priority hires on a case by case basis. Um, those two things uh, should reap us uh, the net, uh, offset the net impact. Um, one of the things that uh, generally does, is not well understood is how sales tax uh, also impacts the uh, funding of school debt. When a certain portion of sales tax, sales tax goes to school debt, we are still um, looking at and, and um, making our analysis for uh, what kind of impact that shortfall in that uh, school debt will have on our general fund. Um, we'll be bringing that information back to the board um, at a later time. Uh, I would like to commend staff for their efforts um, during this period of time, this initial COVID response to not only protect themselves, but uh, protect the general public uh, from the spread of COVID-19. Uh, to date, we've had no positive COVID cases among our employees. Um, I think our uh, early response uh, to mitigating uh, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, the COVID virus uh, here in Union County helped us uh, in that regard, uh, implementing the social distancing, promoting social distancing, uh, promoting the, the uh, sanitizing your hands and your work spaces and things like that has really helped us to uh, forego uh, any positive cases. We could have one at any time, who knows, but I'll tell you that our employees are uh, very well informed and are practicing um, what they have uh, been oriented to in terms of social distancing and and the like. Um, uh, the other thing I would mention to you in that regard is it it has been amazing to see their ability to turn around uh, on a very short time frame uh, and respond to uh, our request of them during this COVID response. Uh, thinking about how they are doing their work processes 
the, the whole telecommuting or telework uh, was uh, not widely used across our organization. Uh, a number of our work groups have figured that out and mastered that, uh, and we have actually uh, seen no decrease in, in productivity uh, as a result of telework and flex scheduling. Uh, we have, I say we have, these, these employees have figured out a way to get their jobs done and serve the public in Union County. Brian talked about you know, the work down in uh, building code inspections and planning and the like. Um, the, I'll, I'll mention the Register of Deeds office. Uh, they've had to think outside the box and they've had to adjust their work processes so that they can uh, get those uh, instruments recorded on time and meet those legal requirements and those types of things. Everybody has had to rethink their uh, workplace reality during, during this time. So when we talk about uh, return, to, it's, it's really not return to work. Uh, several, over a month ago now, we started restricting public access to our, our public facilities uh, in an effort to slow the spread of COVID-19 and to protect our employees. If our employees, if we had a, a, an outbreak of COVID-19 go through our employee population, uh, we would find it very difficult to provide the services um, that we provide and that people uh, count on. So we began limiting public access to our public facilities. Um, but I'll tell you that we have, I introduced the dialogue with our directors and our management team about three weeks ago about what does uh, a return to work, a return to normal, a return to opening up our public facilities to the general public look like. I asked them to start thinking about that all and, and, and because we were going to be coming to them uh, and wanting their input and how we should go about that. Um, and we are at that point in, in time. Um, we have set out three goals uh, for this transition back to uh, opening our facilities to the general public. Um, the first goal is to continue to minimize any risk of transmission amongst our employees. The second goal is to prepare to resume and maintain healthy business operations. And the third goal is to prepare to resume and maintain a healthy working environment. So health, the word healthy uh, appears a couple of times in those goals and minimizing risk of transmission uh, appears in those goals. And so when I think about returning our employees to normal operations and our staff to normal operations, one of, the, one of the challenges that we have right away is our supply our, uh, of cleaning supplies, the supplies that it's necessary to sanitize the workplace. Um, uh, and that be, could be hand sanitizer, that could be Clorox wipes for keyboards and all that kind of a thing. And, and also the personal protective equipment that they are going to require going forward uh, until we really start to see this thing calm down and the numbers start going down. Uh, how we are, you heard the numbers from uh, Dennis Joyner a few minutes ago about personal protective equipment and masks and those types of things. Um, I will say at this point that um, we should all be proud to live in Union County because our community has stepped up uh, when it comes to providing masks, whether that is individuals sewing these, these space masks, uh, whether it is uh, businesses that uh, normally don't produce hand sanitizer or bottles, uh, dispensing bottles for the hand sanitizer. Uh, there are businesses in our community who have retooled uh, to sew face masks. They have retooled to make hand sanitizer. They have retooled to provide these dispensing bottles. Um, and we are taking advantage of uh, 
the fact that they are close to us uh, and we are uh, getting as, as much and as, uh, of those types of supplies uh, on hand for our own use internally, but we are also supplying that out into the community to first responders. We are putting that hand sanitizer that's manufactured here on the EMS trucks, on the fire trucks, uh, at the hospitals, uh, at these nursing homes and other medical facilities around the county. So we should be proud about the work and, uh, that is taking place in Union County with regard to um, that type of activity. To give you a, 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 an idea of the timeline that we're talking about, uh, it's my expectation that our supervisors uh, return to a normal workspace their normal work operations this week, that would be directors, assistant directors, et cetera, excuse me, uh, the directors, and assistant directors, managers, supervisors return the week of the 4th, employees back the week of uh, the 11th in, in the workplace. Uh, we are looking for uh, a, a, what I call a partial reopening of major county facilities the week of, or, or excuse me, on May the 15th you will recall that we did not take the step to close everything down all at one time. Um, we took a step where we uh, were open to the public from 8 a.m. to noon uh, for a week, week and a half uh, before we had to take everything to uh, full restricted access. And we're going to do the same thing in opening back up. We'll go to a partial uh, day uh, opening to general public and then May the 26th which is the Tuesday after the Memorial Day holiday we plan to open all the county facilities back up to general public access now what that looks like that may look a little different than it looked before um, and we are working the management team is meeting with individual directors this week uh, to talk about their plan that they have had now time to think about how they return our operations to a more normal status. Uh, Commissioner Rushing, to your point about parks uh, and recreation. Um, when we think about parks, um, we will continue to uh, have social distancing and those types of things that we, I doubt we're gonna have any team sport type recreation going on, uh, at least for the immediate near future. Uh, so those types of facilities, uh, we'll, we'll still have some restrictions on those. But when you think about the walking trails, uh, maybe the paddle boats reopening the campground, but maybe only renting out every other camping space or things like that, that promote this social distancing that we can still allow uh, residents of our county to come out and enjoy these facilities, uh, we're going to work through that this week and then we'll have a plan for how we roll all that out. I would expect things like Parks and Rec uh, to open before the May 26 time frame, but we'll roll that out. But we'll get some input, more input from our directors and the management team will make uh, um, the decisions about how we roll that out and on what timeline. But that gives you a kind of a brief outline of how we're going to stagger this and how we're going to get back into uh, public access to our facilities. A couple other dates I would just mention to you. The governor's stay at home order is through April the 30th. Um, that may change depending upon uh, his direction. Union County Public Schools are back in session at this point, May the 18th. Uh, and the, our courts are closed through June the 1st. So the timeline that we have set out coincides um, with those uh, measures, uh, if they're not extended, uh, we hope they're not, um, but we, we have a plan and we're working it. Does the board have any questions for me regarding that topic or comments? You might want to put it on the agenda next time, talk about it during the agenda. It, we, we try to keep it short, but like you said, it, it's a lot of information and we, we've had, we've not had time with the board uh, in a while, so.
I appreciate that. Thank you. Commissioner Helms. Yes, I, uh, I received a lot of feedback from our citizens on how impressed they have been with the way the county has been run during this difficult time. And we've talked about how what a fantastic staff we have, our employees, but we also need to recognize our management team. Uh, they have gone above and beyond, and uh, our county, our uh, citizens uh, appreciate all your hard work. Mr. Ray. Um, I want to mention several people. I think some of us all may have got an email from Loretta Melanchon and Litter Busters. Uh, that lady is just um, uh, a blessing to the county. Uh, she's, she, I have talked to her and she said they're still working on their litter. I would like to thank John Shutak. I saw that the, uh, the notification from our manager about the Pinewood short line water extension, it was just a year ago that that happened. So John, I can be nice and thank you for doing that. Uh, communications department, uh, Catherine and Liz and all the people that helped them. Uh, I was actually talking to Congressman Bishop yesterday. He had liked the uh, fact that Somebody in Charlotte said, do it like Union County or take pointers from Union County uh, on the influencers. So I think in the last two months, we've learned how to do a lot that we'll uh, make hay with in the future. Uh, and Congressman Bishop, he also said, thank God for Union County. Uh, he is very proud to represent him. And he's going to Raleigh tomorrow uh, to protest and ask for the reopening that we have also put on our agenda um, to ask the governor to do. I told him that I would be glad to come get him out of jail if he got arrested. And uh, his wife hollered in the background, you're not going to get arrested, Diane, so don't get that in your mind. But, uh, I, 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 it's been a really trying time. I appreciate everybody, um, and that's all. Stay safe. Mr. Rush, I um, would say that I would have uh, liked better to have the uh, item to ask for to be discussed on the consent agenda, move to the regular agenda. Um, we'll be continuing to have issues with it, uh, maybe ask for it to be put on a future agenda. Um, we have a situation where, and the reason I ask about parks and other things, is that if we as a Board of County Commissioners send a letter to the governor asking him to reopen the state, when we don't have our own um, plans to reopen the areas that we can, I, I do have a concern with that. So uh, maybe we can take that into consideration in our uh, letter that we sent to the governor. Mr. Gracious. I just thank everybody for their hard work during these difficult times and uh, appreciate everything that you're doing. I know you're putting in long hours and, and uh, I know that everybody in this county appreciates what you're, what you're doing, so thank you. Just a couple things I would like to uh, also thank uh, Manager Watson. Uh, you know, we are uh, uh, called to different uh, occupations in life and uh, Several uh, are called to public service, and we it, it's it's nice to see folks who uh, are called to public service realize that they have a responsibility to that public to serve that public. And uh, I'd just like to commend uh, Mark, you and your staff on your can-do attitude <clears throat> and setting an example uh, to move this county uh, on forward uh, during this difficult time. <clears throat> the same can be said, uh, I, I've, I've likened it to, there's a, a comment about we are all one body but many parts, and uh, I've said it before, I, I'm not inclined to fight fires, but I'm darn sure glad there are some people that do. And the same can be said about deputy sheriffs and uh, health department nurses and all of that cadre of employees that are on the front line. And uh, I had a few minutes to sit to, 
and watch the uh, emergency management group work, uh, the EOC work one afternoon, and uh, just uh, kudos to all you folks. Uh, uh, no one knows, the public doesn't know the hours that a lot of these people have put in. Uh, I uh, want to also thank uh, you, Frank. Well, let me first say uh, I agree totally, Stoney, with your comment about uh, delineating that in the letter some of the things that we have planned in terms of dates. I think that's a good idea. And I'd like to commend uh, Commissioner Agmus for bringing that to the agenda and to, uh, to provide that letter. Uh, it's often difficult uh, when you, uh, as an elected official and working with staffs, to try and balance uh, the need for caution and at the same time, uh, uh, stay uh, with your ideals uh, and it's been talked about so much lately in the press but um, had this conversation with some of my kids this weekend heard Pat McGrory talking about it this morning on the radio um, we uh, e even before the day we're born but certainly the day we're born uh, we we are faced with risk as long as we live and we're life's a circle and we all get our opportunity. And um, what I want to see this county do, and what I want to see this state and this nation do, is to continue to provide opportunities for my kids and my grandkids. I've had my opportunity. And I think it's time that we, that we pony up and move forward uh, and bring this country back and bring it back quickly. Um, so, uh, having said that, I will uh, make a motion that we go into closed session for the following purposes. To discuss matters relating to the location or expansion of industries for other businesses, including agreement on a tentative list of economic development incentives in accordance with General Statute 143-318-11A4, and to consult with an attorney in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege in accordance with General Statute 143-318-11A3, and to establish or to instruct the public body staff or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by or on behalf of the public body in negotiating the price and other material terms of a contract or proposed, proposed contract for the acquisition of a portion of the following real property, as well as the public utility easement in accordance with General Statute 143-318-11A5, owned by the heirs of Maxine Cunningham Tomerlin, file number 03E0019, Union County Clerk of Superior Court. Described by the deed recorded in book 357, page 172 of the Union County Registry, parcel number 0702103B, for the possible use for an equalization tank with related easements related to sewer operations. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Commissioner Ray? Aye. Commissioner Helms? Aye. So moved. Hey, Jerry? Yes, sir. Uh, is there instructions for us to end this meeting and go into the next one? Should we disconnect and reconnect? Disconnect and reconnect. Yeah. Okay, thank you.
You want to bring everybody some of that strawberry shortcake you could get? <laughs> that didn't last too long. Well, it sure looked good. Those strawberries are good. Cold down there at the 911 center. What? Dang, right. I thought, I guess I got all this new stuff. That's why it's so cold. Man, it's cold here. It's the same way. <laughs> yeah, we just run the shackle. Well, <laughs> Serious cancer. Temporary construction easement and permanent utility easement with attachment A. All in favor say aye. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Okay. <coughs> Richard, something just come out of my screen on me when you coughed. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> we, also, we also have a motion to adopt a resolution authorizing condemnation to acquire certain property or interest in property for a temporary construction easement and permanent utility easement with attachment A as displayed on the public screen. All in favor say aye. Uh, I'd like to discuss it, please. Okay. Uh, oh, 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 hold on. Commissioner Russian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we have the necessary permits uh, to withdraw water from Lake Cove for the Atkin project? Are you asking if we have the FERC permit? The Federal Energy we Regulatory not, Commission We permit. do not have that. That permit has not been issued yet. Uh, it was supposed to have been issued in February. We, we wrote to FERC and asked them to expedite it and issue it by the end of February. And they have chosen. They're not under no obligation to rush. 
Um, and this board is about to vote to condemn properties based on a perm and based on a project that we still don't have the necessary permits for. Is that we, incorrect? We, we, we do not have the per the per permit. Thank you. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Mr. Wright, did you say aye? Aye. No. I, I did. Okay. Anybody had an opportunity to vote? Anything further? Mr. Manager. I don't have anything further. Motion to adjourn. Aye. Aye. Aye.